邀请到行政院唐凤政务委员为我们演讲，掌声欢迎。嗯、so, um, hello everyone. I'm supposed to speak in English,、uh, and、um, this is how we will have this conversation.、Uh, if you have your mobile phone or any other device that can connect to the internet. Uh, please go to this website, slido.com, slido.com, and enter the date of today、um, with a zero before it, so zero one two 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 zero, and then press the green join. And once you're in there,、uh, it is a anonymous、uh, chat room of sorts.、Uh, if you're in there and you see somebody else's statement that you like,、uh, you can just press like. Uh, and if you press like, the one that was the most like will float to the top.、Uh, so there's already somebody that's saying hello now. And if you like the hello, you can also just press like, or you can ask me any questions、uh, with this online platform.、Um, and today, because we don't have that much,、um, you know,、um, preset topic, so you're free to ask me anything. Um, and because it's anonymous and everybody is using their phone anyway, nobody will know that you are the one who asked it.、Um, so、um, before we tried、uh, having people raising their hands or、uh, using their real names and so on, and then we just got some、uh, pretty lousy,、um, you know, questions, lukewarm questions.、Uh, but with a anonymous、uh, forum, usually you have much more challenging questions. And if you don't feel comfortable writing in English, I'm sure that as long as it's anonymous, you you can write in Chinese. Also, because nobody will know that who is the one that writes in Chinese. So,、uh, if you have anything that want to ask me or、um, just have something to say,、uh, please just use the slide.、Uh, and but if during、uh, my talk there is any time、uh, in which you would like to raise your hand or without raising your hand ask a question or just engage your conversation, please feel free to just raise the hand and have a microphone. And. Uh, as usual for my talk,、uh, I will start by playing a few movies, a few very short films that explains、um, my work. Uh, around social innovation and around civic participation in the executive yuan,、uh, but afterwards, it's the floor is open to you. So、uh, you have to ask me some questions. Otherwise, we'll just end after playing three videos, and it will be a very very short、um, lecture.、Uh, so and if so,、uh, if you have something to to say or something to ask,、um, please start thinking about it now. It doesn't have to、uh, have anything to do with. Social innovation or civic participation. You can ask me anything. So with that out of the way,、um, let us play some videos. So、um, the first video, this one is pretty old now. It's the、uh, Lunar New Year this year.、Uh, we started this very short film trying to explain the concept of open government and how and why we're doing it in the executive yuan. It will be followed by quite a few、uh, case studies. Um, that actually illustrates how we're doing the open government work, but the concept of open government, of transparency, of participation, of accountability and inclusion、uh, is illustrated、uh, in this film. Although this film is in Mandarin,、um, I think it has English subtitles. But anyways, so let's just watch this film. Okay, so this is the Chinese subtitle one. Oh well. 
他，然后争什么争？别再争了，让线上正在参与公共政府开放直播的网友来告诉大家。争什么？站在一起做就已，平台大火锅不就行了？笨蛋。后面有说笨蛋吗？<笑>嗯，这食材真新鲜，是谁负责的啊？哎、欸，是我。哦。哦，这汤头真干纯，是谁负责的啊？是我。我。我我我。不，火锅最重要的就是沾酱了。所以我说那个酱汁呢，放上。嗯。呃，没事。哎、欸，这个素食可以吃吗？它是一个阿什么饭可以吃吗？哎、欸，这个乳糖不耐可以吃吗？哎、欸，这个减肥可以吃吗？大家放心。我们火锅制定的过程，不但从最先期就纳入了各界的专业意见，而且呢，在过程里面也会照顾到各个不同的利益相关的群体的声音。只有这样子，才能够让全民的腰围的幸福指数达到最高值。很好吃啊！我从来没有吃过这么开放的火锅，食材料理方式都公开在里面，参与的关系人都可以尽情的发言，再配合逐字稿的发布，让外界了解料理的过程。为什么？为什么要让我吃到这么开放的火锅？要是我以后吃不到怎么办呢？没有关系，自残吃不到。现在就上 P D 四点 T W 公共数位创新空间小组的网站，让大家随时都能够更新开放整理的资讯。一祝大家吉祥如意，鸡年行大运。So that was the first film that our team, uh, the Public Digital Innovation Space, uh, made. Uh, and let's see if there are any questions. You might want to start asking me some questions. Uh, oh well, there's still hello here, so let's just say hello. Um, if you have any questions verbally, uh, you can also raise your hand. If not, we'll, we're going to play the second movie. So um, after this uh, film is made, uh, we started working with the each ministry, uh, and each ministry now has a, a team of participation officers. Um, and so <clears throat> this is actually a regulation that at the moment uh, has been ratified by the executive yuan. It basically says that all the ministries need to have a team of participation officers, and in order to talk uh, with stakeholders. Um, and the idea is modeled after the media officers uh, who talk with, well, the media, the journalists. It's also modeled after the parliamentary officers who talk with members of the parliament, the MPs. Uh, traditionally, um, for the policy making work, if you convince the mainstream media and you convince the MPs, you're pretty much set on uh, policy making. But after the internet and after the civic media, uh, essentially everybody is, is their own media. And so afterwards, it's no longer possible to just talk to traditional media and traditional members of the parliament. It's uh, really essential for people to uh, start to talk with the stakeholders whenever the needs arise. And as a very concrete example, um, this May, we had a petition uh, when it comes to tax filing day. At the tax filing day, as some of you might remember, um, the website uh, stopped for a day. And for people using mobile, uh, like iPad or Linux or Mac or non-Windows systems, uh, the, the tax filing software takes four hours or even more hours um, for, for it to work properly. So it's very um, you know, uh, inadequately designed. And so on our e-petition website, there's this uh, petition that says just, you know, the tax filing software is explosively user hostile. And so um, it is what we call negative energy, fu liang. The, the petition uh, platform at the time is filled with negative energy, uh, started with this e-petition. Now this is a problem that is systematic, that is saying uh, if we respond only to mainstream media and only to members of the parliament, they really offer no help in order to you know, actually make the design experience better. And fortunately, at that time, we already have participation offices in all the ministries. 
So the Minister um, of Finance um, appointed a CIO, uh, the Deputy Minister of, uh, Minister of Finance, and reporting to the CIO is our participation officer, Yang Jinghong. And so after uh, witnessing this invitation, he just raised uh, this case to our cross-ministry uh, participation officer meeting, which we have this virtual team um, here, and we meet every month. And when he raises this uh, idea of having a direct dialogue with the stakeholders, we very quickly assembled a team and to meet on a Friday uh, with the petitioner and people who seconded his petitions. And we uh, discovered the people who complained the loudest, um, as a you know usual uh, saying goes, 会吵的小孩又糖吃. But actually, we're inviting the loudest kids uh, into the kitchen to make sugar. So, so the idea is, is not that they will get what they want, but they get to participate and make what they want. And we discovered that people who complain the loudest are actually professional designers, professional service designer, user experience designer, professional computer programmers uh, who actually know exactly what is wrong with the current text file experience when it comes to non-Windows systems. So we use this technique called user journey as part of the service design technique. We used a lot of um, <coughs> post-it notes. We collaboratively post it on the wall and to go through all the steps that people go through when filing uh, for tax and ask ourselves what are the user's needs, what are the problems they're currently facing, and most importantly, what are, how are they feeling throughout this journey. And so it was discovered that it's important not to just pay attention to the functionality of the system, but to the experience of the user when they're using the service. And so afterwards, we identified quite a few points, like seven points that needs improving. And so following that Friday, we bring it uh, to the Prime Minister. And so the Prime Minister, the next Monday, uh, say, you know, yeah, let's make a change. And so afterwards, we have five workshops uh, together with those e-petitioners, um, civil servants, contracted ID companies, and so on, and to make um, like point by point improvements uh, to the design experience of the tax filing software. And so um, after we start engaging with stakeholders who explain their anger about the tax filing software, the negative energy is actually harnessed to make power, right? So the, the idea is that they now <coughs> get engaged and participates into the redesign experience that turns uh, this year's text filing system into next year's uh, text filing system, which is uh, going online. Just this moment, we're still testing it. But actually, this is one of the um, cases that we very clearly says, OK, people who complain the loudest are now invited as experts and to help us make policy decisions. And so this uh, system has been um, in working in practice for the participation offices for the last, it was like 25 uh, collaboration workshops that we run. And at the start of the each workshop, we play a film that explains how exactly is the principle behind um, working this way, behind this open policy making. There's still no questions, so I get to play the second film. And so, just for background, um, it, it was started out of a rumor uh, on the PTT uh, bulletin board that there was this uh, shawarma uh, food that was rumored to be a kind of animal that <clears throat> just keeps growing uh, on the stick and then people just start torturing this animal and uh, making pe bits and pieces out of it. It started as a joke, uh, but people actually proposed something about this urban myth uh, on our e-petition platform. And so it was rejected. It didn't actually enter petition. But we actually used it as a film. So we spent a couple of hours to make a entertainment educational film to play at the beginning of each collaboration workshop in order to explain the methodology for people who are involved. So let's play it.
说谴责吴家山他在在虐待动物和自己台湾人，所以就就拿来约会，想说大家讨论一下，看能不能成为一个写作的工会跟跟和这件事情有什么关系，可以踊跃发言。动物保护的部分的话，因为牧场里面的畜牧产品基本上属于经济动物，所以这两个业务都跟我们都会有关，所以我想。So um, yeah, we had 25, 26 collaboration workshops uh, since then, and most of the earlier uh, topics that was brought up by the petitioners are now actually policies. Um, the second one, the Taiwan NCAP system, uh, is actually um, the Ministry of Transport and Communications has embarked on a three-year plan to have a crash test site built uh, for Taiwan. And so, yeah, that's pretty much policy now, and it's already budgeted. Um, the third one is about the full life cycle uh, project management for the National Development Council, and that's, again, being worked into a policy. The fourth one is the only one that, at the moment, is not a national policy yet, 
And that is because the Ministry of Transport and Communications said in their motorcycle white paper that they encourage each local cities to experiment with the different uh, L-shaped turned policies in their um, two-lane uh, driveways. And so at that point, the Ministry of Transport and Communication does not dictate each local city to run which experiments at what rate. So we see some uh, cities start doing experiments and actually already uh, relaxing uh, the rules so that the motorcycles can choose to turn on this you know, L-shaped way or on a, a normal one, uh, one turn way. But for many other local city governments, they run some experiments and say, you know, it's not significantly uh, improving. Um, the traffic flow, or it's not significantly decreasing um, the, the fatality rate or whatever uh, during the roads. So each uh, local city is taking a different speed in adjusting uh, its uh, L-shaped left turn rules. Uh, the fifth one was <coughs> petitioned because at that point there was a, I think it was a senior high school uh, that sends this agreement form to all their parents um, asking whether their children uh, is um, willing to stay for the eighth class. But on the consent form, uh, you see check boxes. But the boxes say, I agree, I agree, and I agree. So you can't you know, not click uh, check I agree. And so all the children are pretty much mandatory uh, to stay for the eighth class. And so uh, after we run this petition, the Ministry of uh, Education explicitly say, no, that's not allowed to be an agreement form. It needs to have this I do not agree part uh, in it. And so it's never mandatory now. The sixth one is interesting because um, People uh, may have heard of the, the atropine, but it's called Santongqi. It is a um, it's an eye drop that basically um, alleviates the nearsightedness, especially for younger children. But the younger children are not very willing to use this medicine because it makes their eyes hurt, uh, especially under sunlight. So uh, not many people uh, are willing to use it voluntarily, even though it's prescribed by their doctors. And in Singapore, when they're running a comparison study of the effectiveness of atropine uh, when curing uh, nearsightedness, uh, one of the test group uh, is using a very diluted, like, you know, one, um, one, ten, ten, ten hundred, yeah, ten thousand, uh, one ten thousand of a um, atropine. And in that case, it's not expected to have any effect. It's mostly just so that it hurts a little bit uh, and um, lead people to believe that they have been dosed with an actual medicine. But much to the Singapore lab's surprise, it's as effective in treating and preventing nearsightedness as the full dosage atropine. Plus, uh, when you use uh, the diluted atropines this way, uh, the eyes is not sensitive to sunlight and it doesn't hurt that much. And so the children actually are willing to use this diluted atropine and it still prevents nearsightedness. And so the petition was for the Ministry of Health and Welfare to make this popularly known, uh, to uh, issue its own certificate under TFDA. And then because of the petition, uh, the Taipei City's uh, hospital are now looking into making it a, you know, um, mandatory uh, re um, suggestion uh, for the, the school children who are now um, very willing to use this kind of atropine to prevent nearsightedness. So that's another e petition. And the seventh one is, of course, the exclusively user hostile <coughs> text filing system. And so uh, for the more recent cases, we are um, keeping a full track record of the accountability trail of the policy. So if one goes to penghu.pdis.tw, um, it was one of the more uh, recent examples of us using this open policy making um, way uh, in order to work on a, a marine national park uh, in Penghu in the four southern islands. And so not only we use um, civic technologies in order to outline the final decisions that we're making for the local people who fishes, for the people who are looking to more diverse incomes, uh, for the people working on eco-friendly tourism, for people who live there, as well as the tourists and people who care about uh, sustainability. Um, but also, we also uh, publish how we get there um, of the pre-meetings that we run leading to the collaboration meeting. 
the 360 um, recording of the collaboration meeting itself, as well as the preparatory meetings leading to the press conference. And all of it is kept in full uh, transcript. It's not just people's uh, decisions and abstract. It's actually each and every sentence that everybody said around this matter. So it prove, uh, proves to be very useful to provide a full context for people who are uh, new to this topic and so that they can actually understand each other's point of view instead of just debating um, a few sound bites um, fed to them from the media. And so, again, this uses the uh, post-it notes that we use collaboratively on a whiteboard, but again, it is transcribed into this uh, online digital form of a whiteboard that makes it possible for people to follow um, after the fact. And so, um, we start always with a stakeholder map, like this. Uh, whoops, that's another case. That's the Facebook uh, scam case, right? The stakeholder map. And then, starting from the stakeholder map, we then collaborate to identify the possible solutions. Uh, and so we use the ORID method, where we start with the facts, which are colored in blue, and the feelings, the reflections, which are reflected uh, in yellow, and the uh, ideas to tackle those reflections, which are reflected in green, and the decisions, um, which is here, um, and the uh, relative decision makers, as well as the issues blocking uh, the effective implementation of those decisions, which are marked in red. And so then we take this and translate it into actual working policy that we know that people can at least, at least live with. So that's the methodology. Hopefully there's questions now, yay. Okay, <laughs> so Jenny would like to know that do you think that the participant system is good for Taiwan to build a suitable public policy? Yes, I, I do believe so. Um, in Taiwan, we're now looking at a case where anyone, really anywhere, uh, using the civic media, using Twitter, using Facebook, can pretty much start a public policy discussion without the help of mainstream media and without the help of members of the parliament. And for people to start discussion this way, sometimes they become very um, misleading because they do not start at the same factual basis as the other parties. The idea is that if we start from the same facts, then we can have feelings about those facts. I can feel angry, you can feel happy, it's all okay. And then we converge on ideas that takes care of the most people's feelings, that makes most people feel good. And then we translate those workable ideas into public policy. And that's the ideal view when it comes to policy making. But in the real world, it's usually not like that. Because of the secrecy of the government staff uh, when making policies, and the expert language that people use when forming the policy, it's more often than not the private sectors who has a you know supply chain uh, by themselves, the individual scholars, the individual experts, as well as the government ministries, they talk uh, with one language, uh, the expert language. And people on the street, people who organize their protests uh, using you know, Facebook or Twitter or any other organizing method, they use another language. So even the same words doesn't mean the same thing for both sides of things. And we see that a lot in policy making uh, since the uh, popularization of the World Web. And so when things become uh, this way, uh, the ideas even though they are for the public good. I, I, I mean that all the people on the street and people in the government probably means very well for the society. But the ideas in that environment, because they don't agree on basic facts, they grow into ideologies. And ideologies are those very strong ideas that blinds people to new facts, that blinds people to each other's feelings. And so this is the reality we're now working with. So instead of you know accusing each other of propaganda, of misinformation or whatever, the, the idea is that we just start from fact checking. We just start with the same base of evidence that is not just published by the government as open data and public information, but we also invite anyone who protests, anyone who has a different opinion, anyone who doesn't trust the government to contribute their set of facts. And then starting from those facts, 
we then talk about people's feelings, we then let people's feelings converge. And so I think this is pretty much um, the only way to thoroughly resolve what we call wicked problems. A wicked problem is a problem that can never be completely solved to everybody's satisfaction. But everybody is unhappy with it, which is what it makes it wicked. And so to solve a wicked problem, what is usually needed is that for each participating stakeholder to declare their stake, what is in there for them, what's there to win, what's there to lose, what's the factual basis, and then for everyone to commit to some change that leaves them a little bit better, but nobody worse off, and so for everybody to commit on such actions and then make those actions in a co concerted, coordinated fashion, it then makes everybody's life better but without sacrificing anyone. But so the wicked problem is resolved a little bit more. We see that in the Penghu Marine uh, National Park case uh, very well. But without a coordinated um, action from all the ministries and with people on the street, it is essentially not possible for people to act because they don't trust the other parties will act to improve the situation. So in order to make the trust even possible, we need to start with this collaborative fact-finding process. An anonymous person would like to say that there's too many redundant guan kao job um, interfering with the normal job. Uh, did anyone concern this problem? Uh, yes, I care about this very much. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why I joined the cabinet is to be a public servant for public servants. The idea is that I will not impose on any public servant to do anything that is against um, their will, because I don't command people. Uh, but instead, I just get people's requests to simplify their um, what called their their um, tracking system. So one of the um, issues that we face repeatedly um, during this um, system is um, the simplification or the you know guessing what the top um, layer means, that is usually needed if you just get a random assignment but without knowing the context of the assignment. We see that especially um, when there are cases where everybody cares about this problem and everybody agrees that the problem needs to be solved, but it is to be solved in a way that involves everybody. So for example, uh, this is a case where there are counterfeit um, sellers on Facebook, scams uh, essentially, where uh, you may see something sold very cheaply on Facebook and paid on delivery, and then you buy it and it's paid on delivery. But then afterwards you find that this is actually a fake uh, good. Uh, it's it's uh, broken or it's otherwise just a brick instead of an iPhone or whatever. But uh, when you look at the shipment um, slip, um, there is no sender and it's very difficult to get a refund. And when you go back to Facebook, uh, the seller's page, you discover that the custom service uh, representative is actually a robot. And so it's impossible to, to actually resolve this issue and so on. So it was pretty random. Uh, for a couple months, and each and every of these ministries all received one call uh, assignments, the tasks uh, holding them responsible to solve this issue. But the problem is that without coordinated action from all the different ministries involved, each ministry, each agency is only capable of not fixing the problem essentially, but explaining the problem. Because it is um, without coordinated action, there really is no way to discourage the people to use Facebook in a way that um, is selling counterfeit uh, uh, goods. And what's more, uh, they receive assignments from MPs and sometimes from the media uh, in the wrong way, in the sense that they just complain about one aspect of things, but they find the wrong ministry about it. So they spend even more time um, saying this is not our business and feeling not very well. And so um, using um, open policy making, what we've essentially done is that we invite people who complain about the issue as well as people who are somehow related to e-commerce into this my map uh, mapping. And so instead of having each ministry just holding its own different discussions, we had a unified discussion 
that identifies all the touch points during this um, conversation, during this user journey of from um, uh, buying to shipment and so on. And finally, in addition of clarifying everybody's job and then um, delisting the assignment that shouldn't be going to the ministries at the first time, we actually assigned Facebook something uh, because it is their job uh, as their social responsibility to join the e-commerce association locally and work out the rules uh, that they flag those um, advertisements as well as educate uh, the customers in order to work with the system uh, to flag those inappropriate um, advertisements and so on. And so when I visited uh, Facebook and talked to their VPs, I just showed them this um, policy map and basically says it is your social responsibility identified not just by the government but by everybody involved to join the local e-commerce association and work directly with the stakeholders there. And because Facebook is also organized um, in this way and so they completely understand uh, this line of thinking. So just two weeks afterwards they did join the uh, e-commerce association and has been working steadily to clarify and to clear this problem. What I'm saying is that in many cases, um, the, the ministers or even you know uh, the MPs think just because something is in one call or something that is in source, so something that they, they want the information, uh, it is um, the duty or uh, even the, the obligation for the ministries to produce exactly the things they want. But most of the time, uh, each agency only has one piece of the puzzle, and without a wider context, it is never met in a satisfactory um, fashion, and so it just keeps recurring uh, once and again. And so, although um, simplifying Guangco um, is one of the larger goals that we're also simplifying the science and technology budgets, as well as the NDC budgets and so on, using information uh, system synchronization and things like that, that is the technical part. The cultural part, I think, is just to give more context to all the um, policy makers and public servants so that they can more fully understand why exactly are we doing this and how do we work in concert with all the different ministries involved. Um, yeah, because we are in Taichung, PM 2.5 is a big problem and how is it going and what is the policy? Well, um, there are multiple policies. It is actually one of the most um, important parts, if you look at ey.gov.tw, uh, at the end of the year um, press conference, there's just going to be not just a, a bill, uh, an act, uh, the Air Pollution Prevention Act, but a concerted action uh, to make this issue more apparent. But then again, we also see the information asymmetry uh, in the PM 2.5 issue. At the moment, people use very abstract, very coarse numbers, saying, okay, this many percent is from power plant, this many percent is from those motorcycles, this many percent is from uh, abroad. But it is actually very difficult to say at any given day why and where exactly is the PM 2.5 coming from. All of these are very coarse-grained figures, and that leads to a lot of discussion that is um, not very much to the point as of why and when are we making those policy changes. So um, I think one of the contributions we can make uh, is just to act um, without government's help even. There is a project called uh, Airbox, um, called the LAS system. Uh, that's one of the Gov Zero projects. Um, and hopefully it works. And the way it works is that it installs as an educational tool in many schools um, the measurement of PM 2.5 and instead of just relying on certain um, installations of the measurement um, stations of the Environmental Protection Agency there's lots of volunteers, thousands of volunteers all over Taiwan who volunteer their space, their classroom, and so on to install those PM 2.5 measurement boxes. And so um, the E-Tree um, is actually um, very 
interested in making um, this equipment even cheaper and producing them in a larger batch and with higher precision so that we can rely more on those volunteer data in order to make a more complete picture of why and where the PM2.5 is going. And we also use the special budget uh, in the digital special budget section to build what we call a um, um, Internet of Things for Public Good. Uh, the idea is that we aggregate not just the uh, air data, but also water, also um, you know rain data and earthquake prediction data, and also the disaster related data from NCDR and from all the five participating ministries, and aggregate all these uh, big volume of data on the data centers of the. Uh, National Center for High Performance Computing of Guoang Zhongxin. So when we aggregate all the data this way and add to it powerful machine learning artificial intelligence chips, next year, early next year, uh, I think next February or something, we're now uh, looking for people who can code, who can come up with scientific models to work with all this volume of data inside the National um, Center of High Performance Computing to try to find a model that can let everybody see very clearly where the pollutions are coming from. And so if you have a um, you know, spare um, place um, somewhere in your, in your house or somewhere in your school or whatever to uh, install one of those measurement points, I would encourage you to do so because every new data point is one more data point for the data scientists to work out a evidence-based policy making to address this pollution problem and for the data journalists to actually come up with a useful story that explains the current situation of the pro problem and also let us chart out a way to uh, solve this problem together. And Helen is pretty much asking the same question. What are the power policy that the government will promote? That's a great question. Um, I would encourage you to look into the energy white paper TW, which is again a public participation website. Um, the energy white paper outlines not only um, not only the current progress of the current energy policy, but also the the numbers, the actual evidence data of the different models and how those models relate. Uh, to the uh, yes, here we go uh, to the energy governance, and so um, you can see here clearly the energy governance models, the energy saving models, the electricity renewable energy and green energy models, and um, in addition to those public information, you can also see that how the voices that are gathered uh, from the preparatory meetings from all over Taiwan uh, is flowing into the decision-making process. So again, this is the idea that anyone can declare themselves a stakeholder and their ideas, their opinions, their um, input, their suggestions, they're not restricted to the parts that the government wants to talk about, but instead they can add to the policies that the government is now working on. So here is this uh, overview of the flow of people's input into the current energy policy. So I don't have the time to go through the details of each uh, opinion, how it flows through this um, participation process. Uh, but for people who are interested in our energy policy in the next few years, I highly recommend uh, to take a look at energywhitepaper.tw. So, uh, will an open government become a media controlled state or easily reduce to please the people, but the policy uh, lacks forward looking? Well, this is a great question. Obviously, we are going to work on quite a few policies to please the people. For example, uh, people who use a tax filing software. The process of, of tax filing itself makes people angry. Right? It is impossible to design a tax filing software that by the end of paying your taxes, you become very happy. This is kind of difficult, actually. But at least we can come up with a system that explains clearly in each step what to do and why you're doing this and so on, and not to add additional displeasure at the uh, act of filing taxes. 
The same thing goes for registering a company. The same thing goes for applying for a passport. There are many services that people need to interact with the government, but at this at this moment, um, they have to interact either through paper or fax or other systems, and maybe it needs to um, go through four different agencies. So they have to fax or call a telephone uh, or apply for a seal or a certificate or whatever to four different um, agencies on various levels. But with information technology, with e-government, of course, we have transformed those four agencies into four websites. So now you only have to go to four websites and fill in exactly the same thing in order to register a company or to complete some other governmental service. But while visiting four agencies, at least let you meet four other people and get to know them a little bit, I guess. Uh, going to four websites and feeling exactly the same thing actually frustrates people a lot. And people sometimes get rejections just because they got a form, um, you know, incorrectly designed or the same date but it's formatted in different ways. Or if they're just not using uh, the Windows operating system, um, they may just look at those websites in a completely different way. Uh, than the people using Windows system and Internet Explorer. So in order to make the experience better to please the people, uh, we're making a lot of actions, such as this is so-called the rescue action by youth. Uh, this is a program where we engage with 15 uh, university students, and those university students are charged with uh, looking at all the different websites, all 508 websites of the second level um, units in the executive yuan. And so they look at it using a Windows computer on one side and an iPad uh, on the other side and try to make sure that the experience uh, stays the same, that it makes sure that it doesn't actually prevent the people from doing the things that uh, they wish to do. And so um, for all those different ministries, uh, 10 students take turn and just look at all those different uh, websites and find the issues um, that they spot. And then five um, interns uh, who are specialized in information technology or design actually improves the issue and reports it to the agency. So we go through all the different websites. And the best thing is that those 15 students, they're not working in the office in Taipei. Some of them are working in Taichung, some of them in Kaohsiung, some of them in Huadian, because I can work anywhere. I don't have to work in Taipei. Um, my interns also can work from anywhere. This is a, a well-established teleworking uh, directive. So we use this directive to engage, maybe next year we will engage with hundreds of students to try to make the experience a little bit better by enlisting people who complain about government services and to make things better together. So, of course, we will start from those low-hanging fruits. We will try to make the service more smooth. We will make some policy that pleases everybody and offends nobody. Um, and so this is the lower-hanging fruits. But we're also working on wicked problems. It's not like we only work uh, with the problems that are easy to solve. Quite the opposite. Sometimes we are handed with the problems like the Marine National Park that we can only solve by engaging as many stakeholders as possible. Or sometimes we are handed with this kind of problems that tries to convince um, the people to turn our time zone into GMT plus nine and to align the time zones with Japan and Korea in order to make other people not confuse Taiwan with um, the People's Republic of China. Um, and so for those e-petition systems, of course, sometimes people think that they are joke uh, petitions, but they actually reflect something deeper. They uh, reflect the fact that people actually want uh, to make a dis dis distinction with PRC, even though changing the time zone may not be the best idea. And so for those political cases, we are very, um, you know, usually before the petition to the system, we, we just don't talk about it, even when the MPs raise about uh, this problem. But with the e-petition system, it's very easy to offend one side or the other, but we actually invite both sides together and actually go through what exactly costs to change the time zone, and making the case that um, actually spending such costs to change the time zone maybe wins our international press, um, media, 
uh, for, for one day or two days, but actually people will forget about it very quickly because the PRC will just say, you know, it's one state, two systems, and then and then it's gone, right? So, so it doesn't really achieve much for a lot of cost to adjust the time zone. But then we invite the petitioners to actually brainstorm on the actual deep root problem that they care about. And surprisingly, those people, um, you know, pro and against the time zone um, uh, petition actually agree on the deep core problem and started to brainstorm a lot of ways for all those different ministries to make it more clear uh, about you know Taiwan's international disability and, and things like that. So we then collected it and replied to everybody. What I'm trying to get at is that sometimes it is um, possible, it's easy to please people and offend nobody because it's just solving a small problem that is can be solved by technology or by some design. But most of the time, the state cannot control the media anymore. The people become their own media. And the only way for people to start talking to each other is to, to look higher, to find the common values that are shared, even by people who are very different from each other. To, they are maybe ideal, ideologically different, but they still share some basic values. And it's our work to find those shared values and try to direct people's energy into fulfilling those shared values instead of in opposing to each other. So I think this is not forward looking, right? This is maybe outward looking <laughs> as opposed to inward looking, just working with people who agree with you already. So breaking people out of filter bubbles, I think this outward looking, this exploration or innovation uh, is something that we're working on. It may not be forward looking because it assumes that people have a linear progression, that uh, only your direction is the right direction and you're leading everybody into uh, that direction. But we're not doing that. What we're doing is that making sure everyone can explore on different social innovations and making sure that they are not in the way of each other, they're not blocking each other, and they can work towards something that is a shared value um, by people involved. Can you analyze for us what will be the possible shortcoming of open government? That's a great question. So uh, we just had a consensus um, session from the entire PDS team. Um, and here you can see the core values of our team, which is to build trust uh, between the government and the civil society. Um, and we start by trusting the citizens first. Because if the government doesn't earn the citizens' trust, but still expect the citizen to trust the government, that would be fascism, right? That would be brainwashing. And we're not doing that. What we are doing is that we trust the citizens who make a complaint, who make a petition, who somehow let us know that they are not happy with the current status, and trust them enough to co-create, to create together the policy to solve the problem. So this is the fundamental value of our work. And the secondary value, of course, is to encourage a, a more vibrant civil society to grow and to make sure that social innovation actually touches everyone so that people don't wait for the government to do something. They can instead do something like measure PM 2.5 all by themselves. And so this is our secondary value. Our, our third value is to simplify public servants work using digital technology, using design thinking. There's some other um, values, such as digital service and uh, innovation in the public sector, but these are minor. Um, the most important three values are here. And so the red cards um, are actually the things that makes it the possible shortcomings. So the first red card reads, well, the deep water area, right? So for every open policy making um, job that we do, for every collaboration workshop that we run, for every design thinking process we go through, for every consensus white paper meeting that we go through, for each one of it, there's maybe 10 other cases that are being determined by a top down, by a way that doesn't actually listen uh, to people's complaints that kind of just railroads um, through uh, certain policies. So whereas we're um, getting people's trust using these methods, at the other side, the executive um, administration may be losing people's trust even more quickly uh, than, than we're earning people's trust. And so that is the first shortcoming, is that 
this process itself is still being formed, is still being innovated, but this requires a cultural change for people to expect the government to work in this way. Whereas many people still expect the government to make like the best parent, to make the best decisions for the citizen without the citizen's involvement. So without a change in civil society's expectations of, of government, our work is mostly just a prototype, a test, an example for the other uh, ministries to follow only when the citizens are realizing or are demanding uh, participation in more uh, policy making such as participatory budgeting or now referendums, right, why not? And, and the other uh, acts that enable structured participation can our work be more trustworthy by the civil society? Otherwise, well, there is only so much we can do to rebuild trust. Um, the other um, shortcoming here is that, well, the digital service by itself may not be that welcome by the public service. Um, many people still very much like paper. M many people still like paper clips and, and pen and pencil and so on. So actually we're not forcing the ministries to use digital workflow uh, because we realized one of the shortcomings is that if the tools we introduce actually add to your work instead of taking away your burden, then you'll probably uh, revolt against it. So which is why this is a dotted line. We're not forcing anyone to use any new digital system. We're mostly introducing them and just for people to use when they think they can save their time. But otherwise, it is not mandatory. So that's another shortcoming, is that if we force everyone to use tools uh, before um, people are ready for it, that's another possible shortcoming. Um, many other shortcomings, actually. Um, another shortcoming is that the participation officers in each ministry, they don't have the same kind of resources. There are certain ministries, like the Minister of Finance, Minister of Interior, the um, Council of Agriculture, and, and so on, who have their participation officers lead a team of considerable resource to run this methodology. And also Ministry of Health and Welfare, they are very fluent uh, in running this um, open policy making all by themselves and also working with other ministries. But there are also other ministries, I will not name names, uh, who are not that um, welcoming to this methodology. So their participation offices still attend our meetings and work collaboratively, but they're much less willing uh, to take on cases by them own uh, in a voluntary fashion, and that is okay. So one of the shortcomings is that at this stage, um, everything is, they may use this kind of uh, methodology, the um, and, and instead of should, in huh? So um, everything is at the discretion of their agency and their ministries. And so during the policy formation and promotion process, although we say each governmental agency shall give full consideration to transparency, participation, accountability, and inclusion, but here we say that the PO shall assist the head of the agency concerned to assess whether the agency should carry out an appropriate process. So although it is the PO's job to assess the final decision-making, the policy planning, still is up to the minister. And so if the minister does not like this methodology, or if they think this methodology is detrimental to their policy-making, with this current regulation, we have no way to say the ministry needs to make um, this kind of policy planning or policy development process. So these are the current limitations. I would not say that there are permanent shortcomings or permanent limitations, but this is the degree uh, at which we can run the open policy making methodology uh, at this moment uh, in the executive UN. How many policies are made through open government procedure in the central government? That's a great question. Uh, the collaborative workshops, we have run 25 or 26 of those workshops. So um, you can see actually many of them in our PDIS website because any process that is run through this radical transparency process, you can see a full account of it on our platform. So coming from petition, there are some 26 cases. Um, and coming from the IT departments, there are 
two cases, one relating to the agricultural uh, price of fruits and vegetables, and another related to uh, the um, IoT for social good, um, there's many other ones uh, relating to the e-sport, uh, there are ones relating uh, to social enterprise, so altogether I would say there's about 30, 40 uh, policies formed through a open policy making process that takes the users first uh, at the very beginning of designing the policy instead of having the stakeholders be the last to know. So in the central government we have coached around 40 uh, policies in this way in its various stages. Now compared to all the policies that the central government has done, it's like thousands of them. This is a very small number, but through this process we are empowering the ministries involved to be more well versed in this process and also more willing to use it even without um, our help or without asking for anybody's permission. Well, um, someone says um, Xu Yafen. Uh, I hope I got the tone correct, uh, or not. <laughs> the Sport Industry Development Act was promulgated on November 29th of 2017 to nurture talents in e-sport. What's the plans that the government will do specifically? So um, this requires a little bit of context. The e-sport case is one of the first cases that we did using this open policy making process. Um, at that time, the Ministry of Education did not think e-sport as a sport. Instead, they think of it as an industry, and think the Ministry of Economy Affairs should take it. But the MOEA thinks that it's just focused on the hardware and on the software development. They don't really care uh, or think it's their business to care about the people who uh, participate in such a sport. They think it's kind of a culture. But the Ministry of Culture think <laughs> it only works with intellectual sports such as Wei Qi or such as Bridge Chao Pai, who has traditions. And so it thinks it's more likely than not a sport and should be the Ministry of Education's business. So at that time, none of the three ministries want to have anything to do with the rights of the e-sport athletes. And so using an open policy making process, what we did was we used public hearings uh, co convened by the legislators and they invited the athletes to come and then to explain their problems they face on education, on serving in the military, and, and so on. And then we bring it uh, to this kind of full transcripted meeting and publish every meeting online. So even though each meeting only resolves one part of the problem, for the remaining problem, I have um, the participants edit the transcript for 10 working days and then publish it for everyone by the online to see. And there are many stakeholders who are professionals, really, um, in law or in other endeavors, and they you make useful comments on PTT, on Mobile Zero One, on um, Decard, even on um, uh, Yahoo Gaming, on uh, Bahamut, uh, uh, many other forums to suggest where should we move forward. And we'll, I will quote them on the next meeting and so on. So we gradually uh, work in collaboration with the people who give us useful inputs online to resolve the issue to the point where each of the three ministries are now very much willing to take care of the eSport people's rights as much as the other athletes, as much as the other people uh, specializing in various other sports. So um, at the moment, I think uh, with this new act um, that was promulgated, um, the, about um, three things will happen. First, we will see uh, one of the e-sport um, associations becoming what we call it will be a, a sport association just like any other association and to be governed in a way that is compatible with the new, more democratic way of governing sport associations. And second, uh, we will see a merge, a, a um, synergy between e-sport and other sports because one of the most popular esports in Taiwan is actually uh, baseball simulation. People don't maybe don't have the field to play baseball, or, or maybe they don't feel like playing baseball uh, physically. But people very much like to play baseball um, on their phones and or on their computers. There are many like NBA and, and other um, forums in, in which that they can find the esports games that corresponds to the sport that they like. 
And so I think what we're seeing now is a uh, fusion between the e-sport as well as physical sport. There, there may be uh, counterparts that's being developed uh, by the people who are now recognizing both as sports in Taiwan. And the third thing is that we're seeing many people who work on e-sport will move on to be coaches. And the coaches are not just on um, specific e-sport games, but on the development of an internet community, but on media, on communication, on marketing, um, and many other things, on public speaking maybe. So they have a very diverse set of developments after the height of their competitive gaming um, and area. And so it is just like um, the other sports, when it becomes legitimate, it becomes less you know, rebellious, less cool maybe, but it enables a generation of people to then move on to be um, productive members of the society and by um, you know, sharing their experience and also their funds uh, when they built as a competitive gamer. Uh, Nick would like to know, the members of the city council seem not to support the system of participation budget. So what is the future of PV? Well, this is a, a local level question, right? Um, I, I don't really know about uh, the details of the story of Taichung's PB. Um, I, what I understand is that it's one of the many, um, you know, experiments or innovative ways, including uh, World Cafe, scenario building, and many other ways of uh, including people in the city's participation process. Um, usually, the PB's relationship with the city council, there could be two different modes. One is that the city councillors actually allocate part of their funding available to them into participatory budgeting. And in this case, the PB is essentially an extension of the city council's budget power. And in that case, it will be uh, more in harmony, but also smaller in scale. Or the city um, mayor may impose a PB system that essentially just takes money away from the city council. And that will result in a much more um, tension between the city council and the PB system. And so I'm just speaking theoretically. So um, I think one of the ways to think about it is for the city council to see PB as not something that threatens their legitimacy but actually realizes what they want uh, from the city to have a more inclusive dialogue with people who are involved in order to solve issues that are long-term problems but are just you know, too low priority for any particular councillor to notice. This is how in many districts in Taipei City, how those councillors are relating to PB. But again, I don't really know about the local politics of Taichung to comment intelligently about how to adjust the PB system so it works better with city council. But participation is not just PB. Uh, PB is one of the more easy ways of participation, but there are many other ways as well uh, through community building, uh, through subsidizing or otherwise in having creative grants uh, for local social enterprise or NGO to produce social value and things like that. So I, I will not comment on the specifics, but I think PP uh, was very popular, but it was just one of the ways that the city council can work with the mayor to engage more people. If there are better uh, alternatives, I'm sure that it will be embraced. Um, people said uh, there's two people who want to ask, no offense, but people know that shawarma is an animal. So stop abusing shawarma sound to be a hilarious spoof. It is worth spending time on such issue. Well, the thing is that we spend only a couple hours time. We spend exactly two hours uh, to, to film that introduction. And for every other collaboration meeting afterwards, uh, we play this instead of having me uh, going on the podium and explaining what is the process of our collaboration meeting again. So just by the time we save uh, to explain our process, it's already earned um, the, the time that we spend collectively on producing the film. The other thing is that we did consider using a real case, um, maybe the Hengchun case, maybe the Bonghu case, to illustrate this process. But the problem is, in this case, there are actual stakeholders, and some of them will feel maybe they only get five seconds, while the others that get 10 seconds is unfair. Or even if they both get five seconds, um, they, they get aired first, and then uh, their, 
their other sites, right? So maybe the other side has an advantage because it's there first. So um, because in our team, uh, there's um, a counselor from NCC. He is very sensitive uh, to such matters of balanced reporting in such films. But for Shawarma, there are no advocacy uh, to save Shawarma. There are no Shaolin Ma to protest if we allocate the seconds, you know, improperly, right? So we cannot offend anyone, Shawarma included, um, to when we film things like that. There are actual uh, Shawarma uh, merchants who actually called the executive Yuan when they first saw the film and think that maybe we are, um, you know, negatively impacting their business. But after our careful explanation of, um, you know, the boosting of popularity even, they, they after a while, after a few weeks, sees that there's nobody actually boycotting Shawarma anyway. So, so they, they're like, okay, maybe it's not such a big deal and maybe it doesn't really affect them that negatively. So um, to answer the, this question briefly, First, I think the time spent filming this a couple of hours from um, a few ministries is actually already saved by the explanatory power of this film at the beginning of our meeting. And the second, we really have no other choice because we can't really use the real example while being absolutely fair for every side involved. Um, the API interface for open data needs money, but money doesn't come. What is the solution? Well. The API interface for open data is actually only needs money because the vendors tell you so. Right? Um, if your vendors say we can add open API for free, well then you can add open API for free. And this is why actually uh, we added procurement support for open API related procurements. Um, and this is kind of difficult to explain in English, but I will nevertheless try. Um, so, much better. Um, so, this is what we actually did. First, uh, we changed uh, the public procurement for information services to make Open API a um, national uh, standard as decreed by the National Development Council. And then we say that all the vendors, when they deliver software, if they reuse the open source software that already supports Open API, they only have to declare it as, as such uh, for the agency, and then the agency can reuse uh, those components to deliver service to other agencies. And then we change the procurement rules so that now, when you're making the, the best value bid, which is going to be the default anyway, you don't have to file a special reason for it when the procurement app changes. So you can just uh, do a best value bid. And when you do that bid, um, it actually includes this um, the professionalism, right? the professional skills of vendors. And then we define that for a vendor, a software vendor of information service to be professional, it means that it can provide open API and open data interface to you at zero or little cost. If they say this costs a lot of money, they're being unprofessional, right? So basically when you're doing RFP, doing a procurement from this point onwards, you can just include the delivery of a conformant open API and open data as part of the requirement, just like uh, you would require for a public-facing uh, website for blind people to have accessibility uh, reading at zero or very little extra cost. We model that after the accessibility requirements. So instead of you know allocating more money, more budgets for every single system, we instead say the professional vendors who can use little or zero cost of open source components to support open data are professional vendors. And any information vendor that cannot do this are being unprofessional when they're doing a public bid. So the solution, I think, is just by upgrading all the vendors' capacity to support this at no extra cost in the next procurement cycle. And it's well within your interest to demand this in your next uh, RFP procurement uh, process. Time is limited, how to arrange priority for solving the different problems. Well, you can press like, right? If you press like, uh, the question was more like flow to the top and therefore gets my attention first. 
So it's the same with the e-petition system. It's going to be the same for the referendum system. Any social issues that needs the government's attention uh, are get that attention just by the nature of getting a lot of people countersigning it on a electronic system. But we are not saying that just because 5,000 people are for the referendum act, uh, just because 2,000 people uh, raise this issue, does this automatically mean that this is the only solution to the issue? Maybe their preferred solution, such as changing the time zones, doesn't actually make as much benefit as they first like. But <coughs> what, we, <coughs> what we're building with the participation officer system is a systematic way to think on the shared values that are uncovered beneath the issues that was uh, raised by people. But now that we have 5,000 people's attention or 2,000 people's attention, we can then enlist them into this collaborative thinking to actually deliver the solutions that um, is agreeable by 90% of the society instead of if we go straight to referendum vote just by 51% of the society. If we keep passing referendums that are just agreed by 51% of the society, the society becomes much more splintered over time. But if through this open policy making process, we can get all the referendum act to test their waters uh, on the e-petition platform, then we can converge on solutions that manage to convince 80, 90, 95% of the populace. And referendums passed this way has the potential of bringing the civil society together and in a much more uh, vibrant fashion. So this is how we're um, allocating priorities, but also how we're transitioning those priorities into actual um, problem-solving solutions. Does all the information save in the database and provide access to the public easily? Well, yes, all the, um, all the information processed during the open policy making system are saved uh, in the database. And so, not just the um, accountability trails, but also the discussions and everything um, is get gathered in the um, the accountability trail system here. But whether the public can access it easily, I'll be honest, if you already know the problem domain fairly well, if you can read very quickly, or if you already major in law or public administration or whatever, you probably consider this pretty easy um, and easy to access. Or if you're a senior uh, journalist who covered environmental issues before. But for everybody else, it's not that easy because they are still in expert language. They are still uh, being explained in ways, even though it is um, a, a transcript, the people who enter the discussion already has some professional language behind them. So although it's possible to go through all the recordings and feel uh, the explanations again, very few people actually go and do that. And which is why we, instead of just a policy map like this, we actually produced maps from the viewpoint of each of the stakeholder groups and try to use this material to organize locally and to translate this into the language that they can understand. But these are the early days. We still haven't used all the tools that we can use to make it possible for every stakeholder group to fully understand the issues involved. And this is one of the areas that we're still actively um, experimenting. Jim would like to know, how do you select the stakeholders from people? Since there's 5,000 people who want to join the policy-making process, well, of the 5,000 people or so who um, go to a petition, we just send them an invitation for them to join face-to-face. Uh, -face. And usually, out of the 5,000, only five or six uh, will actually make a trip to Taipei uh, to join our discussion. But many of them actually are willing to see the online records or if we're live stream to participate through a live stream. And so if they are participating from home, uh, for example, when we take the meeting to Hongzhou or to Penghu, anyone can just watch the live stream and enter their opinions using Slido. And then I read through all the Slido comments and bring them back into the mind map. And that has been the way we do the participation. And for particularly controversial issues, such as the drunk driving thing, um, we actually use another system called POLIS. And in the POLIS system, the idea is that instead of 
just going through um, you know, a set of predefined questions or uh, statements, you can actually look at contributions from all the different people involved, and you can click uh, agree or disagree on each of the statements. And once you click agree or disagree, your position moves among people um, everywhere. Right. So um, this system actually is innovative in the sense that basically it lets you see that although people's ideas differ widely, there are still people. They're your Facebook friends, they're your Twitter friends. It's just you didn't talk about this thing over dinner. So it doesn't let people demonize uh, each other. And the other thing is that it values diversity, not numbers. So even though the middle group is 1,000 people, it's not three times larger than any other two groups. It's about the diversity. And finally, although people disagree on many different things, they nevertheless can agree um, a few things. Um, that, for example, that we really need to make a public discussion and convince everyone why this is not the best idea. And so using this kind of system instead of a public forum like Facebook or Line, people, instead of focusing just on the most, most polarized um, ideas, can eventually converge on the ideas that people can all live with. And this is the basis of which we're now uh, running the system of um, policy making so that, just a second, where's that one going? Um, Right, here we go. So this is the this is the idea of a diverse dialogue. Instead of just saying one idea is good, the other idea is bad or whatever, we use this kind of system that let people talk through their feelings and then converge on a set of feelings um, that then builds a dialogue space, a, a stable foundation on which we can have a discussion on human rights, a discussion on whether it's just retaliation, or whether it's humiliation, or whether it's about prevention of repeated drunken driving, and things like that. So this is the basic on which a civil society can have a reasonable discussion. And so that's the methodology that we've been using um, to select stakeholders and to have them participate both online or offline, face-to-face, -face, but with a full recording, or even live streamed over different uh, spaces and then in a connected space to enter each other's discussion through this kind of uh, offline to online, online to offline transcription like Slido and Polis and other systems. So now we're taking a 15 minutes break. Um, so yeah, let's, um, I think this is 8, 12 at the moment. Uh, so let's go back at a little bit later, maybe, um, maybe 30, like uh, 8.30 or so. So yeah, see you in about 17 minutes.
各位学员晚安。我们在下个礼拜三，就是我们会有个休业室。那休业室的时间是六点五十到七点十分。那之后会继续上课，所以请大家就是尽量准时出席。然后我们会有四个全勤的学员来代表我们授那个证书。那其他的学员证书的方式是文官学员会另外通知。然后我们下年，我们明年还有同样的活动，如果还有兴趣的学员可以密切关心我们这个活动的讯息。谢谢。
各位学员晚安。那如果有人还没有发言过的，赶快趁这个机会跟老师互动。那有互动的学员都快出来跟我们拿那个回调险。然后我们有更新最新的那个回调的状况，所以刚才对那个字很小的那一张是比较旧的。那如果发言记录想要再更确定的话，等下下课都还可以出来再对，谢谢。All right, so welcome to the second half uh, for an hour uh, our discussion. Uh, I'm very happy to see that there's 12 questions now, so we will not uh, stop earlier than uh, expected. We will have plenty of uh, questions to talk through, to talk about. Um, the top question is, did you discuss national travel card? Uh, indeed, that was, this was the first case. It was the case that was discussed even before the POs formed the team. It was the case um, that actually promoted the participation of the system themselves to join our discussion. Um, so at that time, when I first joined the cabinet, um, there's already um, a petition about the national travel card. Some of you may still remember this. Um, so it was almost exactly a year ago uh, where this Winnie um, said that the national travel card should not um, you know, make a um, just specific traits uh, benefits, and it gets 8,000 counter signatures. And afterwards, there's another uh, petition about the cancellation of the national travel card and uh, to uh, resume. Um, so at, at, at the time, um, maybe some of you still remember, there is a lot of misinformation about the national travel card. Some people think that this is an additional bonus that all the public servants get, and it, uh, you know, it's a payout that's using taxpayers' money uh, to, and, and it's, it will, you know, uh, let the, the national budget uh, suffer for uh, or something. On the other hand, we have people saying, well, no, this is a cost-saving uh, thing because for higher-ranked uh, officials, if you just pay them extra uh, work days um, in, in their salary as compared to a fixed rate of the national travel card, uh, the, the national government will actually pay more. And so this is a saving um, scheme for the national government. It saves Bashi. So, so in the popular media, for the same policy, we have a difference between the benefit uh, of one side and the other side of policy making. And again, this is not backed by any evidence at all. They just have different facts uh, on the public media. And so it creates a lot of confusion and a lot of you know, um, ideas about how to improve this situation. So one of the early contributions is that we use an evidence-based uh, uh, calculation in the public petition platform to make everybody see very clearly that this is actually a not a benefit at all. And this, on average, um, is reducing the payout to public servants and to the order of urgency. And we detail how exactly we're calculating this. And then um, we have people from every ministry who want to become participation officers to brainstorm on the issues relating to the National Travel Card. And so the National Travel Card is actually the, the workshop, the consensus building um, issue that we have the ministries each grouped into a few um, ministries and then uh, start working on aspects of the National Travel Card. Its use, its purpose, is changing the policy making process, whether it affects the dignity, whether it's as a misnomer, um, and many other things. And then we gathered those eight groups, uh, hopes and fears and concerns and so on, and made a complete mind map about first the naming and whether it's actually um, encouraging people to take time off or not, or whether it's too much of a restriction and then whether the lack of communication is a problem, I mean, everybody thought it's a problem, and um, the dignity, and um, a lot of um, confusions and willingness um, to, to talk and to clarify these confusions. So we brought this to the Prime Minister uh, and um, basically asked him uh, to, to confirm um, the idea of clarifying the whole situation which is what, what we did at the first time, and so um, this is the 
um, evidence that we start basing discussion on. So everybody is on the same factual evidence. And the second thing is that many people think that maybe um, it's not the best idea for the um, executive union to decide such a benefit-related thing all by itself. Maybe it's a better idea to consult all the uh, public servants on this issue. So this is why we had a what we call the internal participation uh, system where we selected by randomly drawing lots a committee of steering committee of uh, participating in the internal feedback system. And recently, uh, we are now transferring this team from the National Development Council to the HR department to Renshi Xingzhen Zongchu because we realized that the HR department is actually closer to the Kaohsi Yuan, to the Quan Xu Bu, who can actually make changes to, to these issues. The National Development Council may advise Kaohsi Yuan to do something, but the Kaohsi Yuan may ignore it, or it doesn't really have such a good bidirectional relationship. So we're moving this to the HR department. So that's the, the other part. And as for the National Travel Car itself, um, we then made a user journey of how exactly are we using the National Travel Cart. And many people find that a lot of the pain points are in the Hexiao uh, part, because it is not very clear whether a region is uh, a tourism region, or whether a shopping for books, or for hotels, dinners, or whatever, is a tourism-related uh, thing. It's very difficult uh, to, to look up, and an information system, uh, frankly speaking, is very difficult to use. And so this uh, then prompted uh, Renzong and the NDC uh, to send out a survey to all the public servants about the changing of the names and also the relaxation uh, of the various traits. And they now are now collecting the survey uh, as the result for the next year. Uh, from what I heard lately, they are now acting on the aggregated results. So there is a possibility that uh, one half of the national travel card, instead of trying to, to look at which uh, part is tourism or related or not, maybe it would just be a benefit without any restrictions. But this is one of the most popular ideas we received from the uh, whole governmental survey. Uh, but uh, because I'm not involved in the policy making at the, the um, aggregation stage, I'm only involved in the designing of the process stage. So I really don't know what the final discussion will be for the next year. But at least uh, we have a policy development process throughout the year where we collect the survey responses and evidences and make it public for, for everybody to see. So um, because this is our first um, topic, literally, and this is what brings the POs together, uh, literally, so um, we at that time did not really have a very clear action plan for the Prime Minister to go through. Instead, we just identified the issues um, that was raised by the petitioners and also by the participation offices. <clears throat> but I think uh, still something good came out of this exercise, although it is not a, a real um, shawarma demo-like uh, full double-diamond process of converging and um, uh, diverging ideas and converging on uh, actionable ideas. We just basically diverged and then allocated all the different suggestions and made it uh, clear in a mind map. But still, I think something good came out of it because the participation officers who came to this meeting actually felt, um, felt the position of angry petitioners because they are all stakeholders themselves. And then they understand a little bit, a little bit more what, how it feels like to petition to the government uh, to change a policy that affects yourself. And so I think this is a team building exercise that makes the participation office much more sympathetic to people uh, who are coming to us with e-petitions of more than 5,000 people because they themselves have been on the petitioner's side and arguing with the other uh, NZO and NDC um, and also uh, MOTC on this policy. So we did discuss this. We discussed it over like three different workshops and maybe some of them will be reflected on this year's uh, National Travel Card Policy. Um, it's an impressive job for doing the collection of the big data of pollution. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't do that job. Uh, my work is mostly designing the protocol, the um, ways, the APIs for the different collection points to share with each other. Because previously, um, these um, volunteer spots are treated with distrust from many governmental agencies. 
Um, the Environmental Protection Agency are still pretty friendly uh, to these people, although not completely trusting. But many other ministries, I will not name names, at the moment <coughs> still doesn't fully trust those citizen-contributed um, points. But I think it is much to the credit to the Board of Science and Technology team uh, to be willing to include such uh, crowdsourced, volunteered citizen science sources in the planning of the Gongo Misha Uniwan system. So the system is not special because it is uh, collecting what specific data. It is special using a special budget because it is, for the first time, a collection between the cross-ministry data and also cross-sectoral data from the private sector and from the civil society together. And I think this is because whether you're from the private sector or from the civil society or from the government, everybody really wants to have a full understanding of the air pollution problem. It is for everybody's benefit to get a complete picture. And so nobody hinders the, the progress. And we look forward to do the same uh, for water pollution and for many other um, environmental um, data sets. And the other thing is that um, the air, the water, and uh, rainfall, and mountains, and whatever, they, they don't have privacy. Right, so they will not argue that their data should not be collected. So mostly we avoid the personal data collection issues when we work on the Gongomisha project. For data that actually concerns real people, there is a, another set of issues to be worked through. But Gongomisha Wuyang allows us to work on this cross-aggregated data system without worrying about the personal data and privacy concerns. Kevin would like now to know, at this stage, are we actually doing away with nuclear or not? Um, well, it is in the law, right? Uh, and the law now says that we have to uh, be nuclear free by 2025 or something like that. Um, and so, unless someone changes the law, that is the goal that we're, we're all working towards. Um, and I think, fortunately, the, the cost for the solar panels and hopefully for offshore uh, wind turbines, are really decreasing over time. So we may actually uh, make it. And the other thing uh, that is fortunate is that the cost for a useful battery uh, is now also decreasing. Because mostly people worry about the spike needs. But the more, more energy store we can use using battery technology, the more resilient will the energy grid be uh, when it comes to spikes like this. And so, yeah, we, we may actually make um, the, the law mandated nuclear free goal. Um, Asker would like to ask uh, if national security is more benefit than private information security, do you think civilians really need to give up their information security? Well, this is a very curious question. Um, I, I really don't think national security is anything more than the security of individual citizens. I really don't think there is exists a security that's called national security apart from the security of every citizen in, in this uh, nation. So I, I don't think those two values are in contrast, really. I think by constitution, we have a right for um, private conversations, for communications, for speech, uh, for assembly. And this is what, what nation means, really, because this is uh, how people conduct and um, around each other and how the society is formed. If the um, constitutional um, human rights are violated to a degree where only some people has freedom of speech, some people has freedom of communication, then essentially it's not a nation uh, anymore. It is uh, more like one nation here and then an enslaved uh, state um, around it. It will be like feudalism. And so um, I, I don't think um, there is something in tension uh, here. If someone thinks there should be a national security apart from the private uh, communication or security, then I think that someone is pretty misguided. Uh, the idea of national security is built on people feeling safe and secure around the use of digital technology or really any other technology as a medium for expression and communication. Um, so, someone said pension problem caused a lot of frustration of civil servants badly. Yeah, it's true. And any possibility to fix it? Um, I think at the moment, um, well, ap 
apart from raising everybody's base salary by 3%, um, I really don't know other policies directly related uh, to the pension system. The pension system would not actually cause so much damage if at the first time when the issue was raised and then as a national issue, I think it was uh, Mr. Guan Zhong who first formulated a plan uh, to reform the pension system, but it, it did not get corrected at that point. And so by the time we actually go through and uh, correct it um, a year ago, um, it's way beyond the point of repair actually when we're talking about the financial um, system. And so, yeah, it, it's really nobody likes the solution, but people live with it. And so um, I think this, if there's any more to this story, is that we need to start talking about long-term problems long before it becomes a critical problem. If there is already a critical problem way beyond you know, the repair, um, any solution is bound to make people frustrated. I think this is a, a, a lesson or a moral from this story. I don't really have anything more to contribute um, to this issue. Um, so far, do you think the implementation of the policy of government is effective? Well, um, depends on how you, how you compare it, right? Compared to every other country in the open government uh, partnership, Taiwan is probably the most, one of the most effective ones implementing open government policies, and we have a very clear direction. But that's an unfair comparison, because first, Taiwan has one of the highest internet penetration rates. Um, Taiwan, just because of the geography, it's easy to have broadband internet access everywhere uh, on the island. And the last few percent that still did not have broadband access, we now say human, it's human right to have internet access, so allocate special budget to make sure that the last few percent are now filled in as well. And so because just because of the geography, it's easier to digitize the public service and have e-petition system and so on without so much worrying about people who don't have any connection to the internet, which is pretty much what every other country uh, is worried about. So that's, that's one unfair advantage. And the other unfair advantage is that we're already um, based on the idea of complete uh, freedom of speech because um, our generation really is the first generation that has complete freedom of speech and still we remember the martial law days where we don't have freedom of speech so nobody will want to lose at this point the freedom of speech which makes it much more easy to advocate for a strong civil society for participation and indeed the participation on public discussion online, the, the ratio, I think Taiwan is number two in the world uh, just after Norway or something. Um, but uh, for access for public uh, conversation, for use of internet to further uh, one's goal, actualization uh, for, for women, for example, Taiwan is the first in the world. And we're also one of the most highly educated when it comes to internet citizens. So, so we started pretty well. It is that we don't have to do much uh, in order to get into a good state of open government. But on the other side, if we compare Taiwan with some cities like the capital city of um, Iceland or the capital city of Spain, Madrid, uh, or Barcelona for that matter, or for, for some other city level, or Estonia, which is pretty much a city, um, but it costs itself a, a country, but it's pretty much city-sized. When we compare ourselves to those city states, they were more on par of each other and we used a lot of each other's tools. So I think Taiwan, geographically and because of high speed rails, is more of a city now um, than a, a full country when it comes to uh, comparison with other people in the open government uh, partnership. But population wise, we have far more people than other city states. So this is a very interesting combination and I think it gives rise to a lot of more active participation of uh, online policy. So yeah, I think we're pretty effective, but it's not because we did something um, like very ingenious or, or very well. It's because Taiwan people started very willing uh, to participate politically. Um, public opinions may be manipulated by certain groups on the public talk platform. How to avoid that situation? 
Well, by being inclusive, and being inclusive means to let as many group to manipulate as possible. So it, when all the stakeholders becomes um, part of the process, when they can manipulate um, each other's opinions very effectively, there is less of a problem of a single stakeholder group driving all the discussions. So, which is why actually all the systems uh, we use the Slido platform, the join petition platform, uh, and many other platforms that we use, the POTUS platform you just saw, um, everything we did here, uh, for example, whatever, this one, right? Um, we, we have a public commentary section here, but you will notice that just like Slido, just like POTUS, this system, you cannot reply on any uh, other people's comments. You can only vote to bring them higher or downvote to bring them uh, lower. And you, you, if you have a counter opinion, the only way is actually to propose a counter opinion on the other side of the column instead of replying to one specific comment to the other column. And so again, it needs to um, get more people's support. And so by designing the space this way, we don't waste people's time refuting each other's uh, arguments or you know, washing the, the board. But instead, we encourage people to raise their different opinions. We aim for diversity instead of just by, you know, comparing the numbers. So even though there's 200 comments here and 39 comments here, we don't um, adjust the bar, right? We, we don't visually hint that there is any voting going on. This is basically just people raising their concerns from all the different angles. So it, it becomes very difficult for any specific site uh, to control the discussion on the e-petition platform. And eventually we see all the different varieties of uh, ideas being surfaced before we enter the face-to-face -face, uh, discussion. And so this is by design. We, instead of replying, just have people raising uh, each other's voices voluntarily in a way that adds to each other instead of competes with each other. Um, Krista would like to know, is it possible <coughs> to implement online referendum in the near future? Yes, it's actually required by law. The, the Referendum Act just gets passed and it charges the uh, Central Election Committee, Zhong Hui, to build an online system uh, for online referendum. And so in the future, uh, referendum will not be paper-based only. It will be possible to go to an online platform, much like the joint platform, but instead of one person raising a petition and 5,000 people counter signatures uh, that could give a governmental answer, maybe some of those 5,000 people will then come to the online referendum system and propose a um, more well-rounded um, proposal of their petition and then on an online referendum system get the counter signature of I think 230,000 people or something like that before it gets into the popular vote uh, by the referendum. So it will feel very much like an extension of the existing joint system. And the participation officers who are now working on the uh, e-petition system will form, I think, the backbone of the team that will now um, start to work with referendum act um, petitions in the future because everything is the same e-petition system underneath. Um, Kate would like to know public opinion that values public opinion is correct. How to make professional advice truly respected and valued? This is a great question. So um, when we go back to the stakeholder map, this diverse uh, discussion is, I think, by far the most important. And by diverse discussion, we really mean that, just a second, that every ministry here, who may start at a very different point or a very different role on any public issue, actually sits um, on a round table and talks with other professionals. M not many people working in the central government has the local knowledge uh, from the local fishing people's um, association, and not many fishing people have a diving um, experience and not many people having you know, the experience of snorkeling and things like that. So it really takes everybody in order to translate each other's expertise 
in a way that every other people, other side can under can understand. And so we design the discussion in a way that actually not just let people to speak based on the facilitator or on the um, public officials' uh, direction. Instead, uh, we make them add to each other's arguments by very clearly marking the factual, the reflective, the suggestions, and the problems. And so on this way of collaboration, each card represents something that is substantial when considered by one side of the stakeholder's uh, professional uh, expertise. And when it comes uh, for policymakers to look at these cards, we refer back to the transcripts in which those people with that expertise ex explain that particular card. And so the idea is that every expert can only add to the discussion without taking anything off the, the board. Everyone has to respect each other's expertise when it comes to one specific part in the sport. And so this is our um, design of the collaborative workshop in that people can only uh, respect and add to each other, other's discussion and they cannot prevent other people from speaking or taking their arguments away. And so this is so that we can, after identifying the problems, then reintroduce the experts to let us know how exactly can the ministries uh, involved improve their work in order to address the problems all in a coordinated fashion. So the two main point is, first, to have a safe space where it's impossible to interrupt or to prevent other people from speaking. And second, to have a collaborative space where everything is added to a shared um, understanding instead of competitively uh, taken away from each other's uh, speaking. Tree cut uh, is an issue. Um, does the central government pay attention about that? Um, I assume the problem, the question is talking about deforestation, um, Kanshu or whatever, uh, preservation of forest, or does the person who raised the question would like to elaborate more? Uh, I don't personally know much about uh, the policy about forestation. Uh, it has not been, indeed, it has not been raised uh, as a petition issue. So I know very little about our forestation and conservation issue. I do know, however, uh, within our Wutubuihuafa, our uh, land use planning methodology, uh, there will need to be uh, dedicated areas uh, about farming, about forestation, about all the different uses. And those uses will need to be deliberated, again, in a multi-stakeholder open fashion by all the local people involved. And so within the Wutubuihuafa, framework, there is a lot of room for this kind of informed discussion and deliberation that I just uh, introduced, and I'm sure that it will include expertise on um, uh, forest um, preservation and, and so on. But personally, I really don't know much about this particular issue. Um, what do you think about China's warplanes, uh, drills, and surrounding Taiwan? Um, so. Very interestingly, because part of my working uh, condition when I enter the cabinet is that all the information that I see, I can publish. Um, so in the in the Freedom of Information Act, there is a clause that says all the drafting stage uh, information is not to be published unless it is for the public benefit to avail only and approved by you know, the, the, the higher-ups, right? So the idea is that most of the drafting stage, what we call Zhengze Li, um, is actually by default not open to the public. Even after the policy is set, we cannot publish the history of the drafting stage unless we can prove it is for the public good. And it's difficult because if you convince your boss, but not your boss's boss, and as long as within the command chain there is anyone who thinks it's not for the public good, then you don't get to publish it according to the Freedom of Information Act. But my working condition when I negotiated with the Prime Minister when I joined the cabinet is that I say all the information that I look at, I consider its publication to be for the public good. And so, right? so I get to publish everything. But in, in exchange or 
a natural consequence of that is that I cannot look at national secrets. I cannot look at confidential information. When there is a military drill where all the cabinet members go to bunkers, I actually take a day off. So I still don't know where the bunkers are. So I'm completely shielded, completely uh, prevented from accessing any national security issue or even confidential or highly confidential issue. So I don't know more about China's war plans than anyone reading the newspapers. So I, I cannot give an informed response because any confidential information, usually about foreign affairs or about the ideas of defense and so on, I, I can't even look at uh, those information. Even if it accidentally goes to my office, it's just cleared by one of the counselors working there. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I really don't know more than anyone reading the newspapers about this. So I don't have an informed opinion. Um, so, Slavia would like to know, did our government use transparent platform to work to each other on not labor law and on national population issues? Great question. Um, we actually talked with the labor um, petitioners um, during the e-petition issue where they talk about the holidays. Um, I think it's called the Guoding Jia Rifa, the National Holiday Deliberation. Here we go. Right, so um, this took place uh, in October, and there were some protests, but actually they did agree to attend our participation meetings. And this is a photo that I really cherish, because this is, uh, I think, to my knowledge, the only time where in a live-streamed, uh, all-recorded uh, environment, uh, protesters from Gongdou and representatives from Gongzhou and Shangzhou actually work together on the same table and using post-it notes uh, to, to share their understandings of the current labor situation. Um, and although the petition was about um, the uh, relative benefits of having seven more holidays versus not having seven more holidays, we nevertheless cleared up a lot of misunderstanding, just like the Erxiqi on the Guolika uh, issue. Um, one side saying, you know, according to OECD, uh, Taiwan has the, um, the world's sixth highest uh, working hours on uh, average compared in OECD countries. But actually, um, when seen from the some other side, when we just compare full-time workers versus full-time workers, Taiwan is actually one of the lower, um, you know, uh, working hours when it comes to full-time workers. But the main difference being that there is not many part-time workers in Taiwan. Compared to OECD countries, um, Taiwan is almost exclusively full-timers. But why is that? It's because most OECD countries has a law protecting the labor right of the people who work part-time. But Taiwan does not have this kind of law. And in, in actually, most of the society view them as just doing gigs, dadding gong, and generally is frowned upon. And so this is as much a cultural issue as a legal issue, but without the legal basis to enable part-time working. Basically, this full-time working structure is pretty unique um, in Taiwan. And of course, we also worked on a lot of the actual uh, economic models and uh, studies needed to calculate it. But we also identified um, the issues of the salary of overworking, of uh, not adhering to the basic labor laws, and also the lack of the organization and the current labor unions uh, in order to talk uh, with the, the um, companies and so on. And the important thing is that all the posted notes here are understood and pretty much agreed by all the different sides um, going to the collaboration meeting. And because of this, um, the responses that we got um, to identify the issues for the NDC, for the MOEA, and for the MOI to work with is actually pretty welcomed by everybody uh, working on this particular issue. But of course, I like um, the um, taxation, um, the, the tax filing system uh, workshop where we have five workshops after the initial collaboration meeting. After this meeting, um, as many of you know, uh, there, the labor law adjustment uh, is proposed 
uh, to the legislative yuan. And so we don't get to do collaborative workshops after this uh, initial meeting. So I would say to, the, to this question, yes, we did. We did use a transparent platform uh, to work at the beginning of this issue. But then it was temporarily, I hope, um, kind of stalled uh, or blocked a little bit by the current legislative UN process. But I still do hope uh, that in the future, for the parts that are identified by the labor movement people and also by the people uh, who work in Gongzong and Shangzong, that we do have a useful part-time uh, working uh, protection, labor law protection law, that we do have a way to really enforce those uh, labor union rights and things like that, which is pretty much agreed by all the stakeholders who came to our collaboration meeting. So we'll still work toward those policies, although at the moment um, the, the collaboration workshop is not ongoing. And on national population issues, um, I assume that means the, the Shaozhen Yuhua Wen Ti. Um, at the moment, um, I don't think there's anyone working on the e-petition platform on this, aside from uh, asking the Minister of Health and Welfare to not send um, Xin Shou Yue Bar or whatever by Bao He uh, as part of the special budget. And the Minister of Health and um, Welfare did actually uh, listen to that uh, e-petition. But there's no petition at the moment um, working on this issue. And as for a national dialogue, we haven't, as far as I know, uh, scheduled a national dialogue on this issue, although it is one of the long-term uh, top issues that we're going to talk in our uh, horizon meetings uh, when it comes to science and technology planning. So mostly this is a uh, planning session in reaction to the re reduction of population. This, we're going to have an open policy-making discussion. But uh, if your uh, idea is how to reverse the population decline, at the moment we don't have a uh, deliberation meeting on that. So we kind of assume that that's just going to be a fact and introducing science and technology to make everybody's life quality still good, even though the population is shrinking. As to the cross-strait relationship, the winds seem to blow to the mainland China side. Will Taiwan be eventually engulfed? Well, personally speaking, I, I see Taiwan as, uh, and I understand that I'm very alone uh, in this political stance, but I, I think Taiwan uh, is, is around before human beings are around. Taiwan is around for a million years ago. And, and I think uh, human beings, um, it is one of the species that occupy uh, this island for a while. But as long as we don't destroy the biodiversity, we should be still able to give rise to the next sentient species. And we're just all just homesteading uh, this island at the moment. And Taiwan is still raising five centimeters every year. And so this, this view is called deep ecology. Basically, I, I don't see human as a more privileged species than any other species uh, when working with Taiwan. And it's with this view that I think uh, rivers and marine national parks and fish and whatever should all have their legal personhood and have people who speak for them. And so this is a very radical position. And in that posi position, I don't really think Taiwan, the island, or the ecosystem um, is going to be engulfed, geographically speaking. Uh, now, um, as for the civilization, right, the mainland China is now experimenting with one governance structure. In Taiwan, ex experimenting with open government and open government policy making, gradually we say larger civil society. I think we're experimenting uh, along very different dimensions. There are some experiments that only mainland China can do because it will not be seen as constitutional here in Taiwan. And again, there are some experiments only Taiwan can do because it will not be seen as constitutional uh, by the PRC. And I think it's good because we're both making contributions uh, to the civilization, uh, experimenting with different uh, governance methods. Long as we are experimenting along different lines, instead of trying to arbitrarily uh, compete on each other's dimensions, I think we're doing okay. And I think the Earth can use uh, more than one governance experiment uh, in this region. That's my personal political view. How to make sure that safety of the government cloud, which we'll build in the near future, there's all, always potential for security problem, that's for sure. Um, mostly the, the security problems is actually in the terminal systems, in the, uh, in the personal computers use, used to access the system. For example, any computer that still runs Windows XP 
uh, access the information system from the central government cloud in a unsafe way. The Internet Explorer version in Windows XP cannot support a, a more secure uh, connection method. And so it becomes very easy to, to attack such terminal systems and take control of the, the public service systems. And so uh, part of the special budget is what we use to upgrade the hardware so it can at least uh, run Red Hat um, the next or run Windows uh, 7 or, or Windows 10 uh, because all of them require one gigabyte of RAM whereas the Windows XP requires only very small numbers of hardware. So we are upgrading everything in order to include um, more computers into the secure communication um, infrastructure. The other thing is that we're hiring a lot of white hat um, hackers to attack those centralized systems. The system that we built uh, the Sandstorm system that we deploy in the Executive Yuan. We hired um, both people from the private sector as well as people um, in the public sector, Ji Shu Fu Zhongxin, to try to attack the system and find vulnerabilities. And when they say, okay, they, they think that this is pretty safe and this is an open source underpinning, we then make more full use of it and host all our collaborative documents. Uh, so if you have a gov.tw email account, um, you can just go to ey.pdis.tw and make full use of the system. For example, for ordering lunch boxes together or whatever. Right. So, so we have a lot of applications this way. What I'm saying is that uh, the safety is not something that you can just certify. Safety is a dynamic property that is defined by people constantly hired to try to attack the system and tell you how to improve the security as well as the good notification system so that when there's like five different layers of protection where the outer layers are broken, you at least get a notification and time to adjust uh, for, the, for the intrusion. And so this is basic cybersecurity design and we're also extending that to the critical infrastructures like power plants and electricity grids and whatever, instead of just um, the Xiangshan Jizhou ministry, uh, ministry level uh, data centers. Um, two people would like to say that it's truly a very, very nice class tonight and that uh, they want to thank me very much. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this class is about crowdsourcing. Everything that I say is because of someone asking a question. So, yeah, thank you for making this a excellent uh, discussion. How is comp power company? to acquire private power, whether it's a good policy. Well, it's true that we're trying to diversify uh, the power companies. Um, Japan, for example, did very successfully when they have all the different communities using solar panels or other renewable energies uh, to have people build <coughs> very small power companies, essentially, all across Japan. It's not to replace the, the Tokyo Power Company. It is to make sure that everybody have a more full understanding of how the power grid works, how the energy policy works. It is essentially like participatory budgeting. It is not, for example, allocating 95% of budget for participatory budgeting. It's not like that. It's like 5% or less. But just by participating in the energy policy, contributing 5%, for the national uh, energy policy makes the energy policy something that everybody can talk about. It becomes what we call a social object around which people can have a uh, informed discussion like talking about today's weather, right? So when people have an informed discussion, it's much easier to communicate about larger scale energy policy this way. The, one of the issues Taiwan did face uh, before was that because the Thai power company essentially defines the whole energy policy, it means that people actually did not know very much about all the various different uh, energy types and the layout of the power grid and things like that. And because of that, there's a bunch of people who blindly trust Thai power. And there's a bunch of people who blindly distrust Thai power. And because of that, it's almost impossible to have an informed energy policy discussion just because people did not really participate to understand about the energy policy. So we see the same structure over the place, participatory budgeting, participatory energy, uh, private <coughs> energy plant making, um, eventually participatory um, uh, court systems where they The judges uh, meeting um, on the uh, having a case heard and things like that, participatory uh, justice system. 
uh, the, the reason is not that we're looking for the policymakers to be replaced uh, by people, not the whole budget replaced by people, not the whole um, energy grid taken uh, out by individual power plants, and certainly not the court system replaced by the jury, but by rotating people's participation, people can then have a more informed discussion when a national policy needs discussion by the people. <clears throat> In your opinion, which country has successfully implemented the open government idea? That's a great question. Well, I would name some cities. Um, the the Madrid, the Madrid city is something that many people look look up to. Um, the the city of Barcelona, uh, for example, uh, also does it very well. Um, as for the PB and and other participatory workshops and uh, like what we call the policy labs, Paris city actually does it very well. But um, even the Paris city people that I work with, um, because I used to stay um, of the 12 months, um, I stay five of which uh, in Paris, I work very closely with Paris City. They admit that their methodology doesn't really scale uh, outside Paris. So it's like Paris is its own country that does open government, but it doesn't really extend to the rest of France. Um, and so, yeah, we, we see New York City now allocating a civic hall just for the open government and participatory um, uh, methodologies. But again, the New York City is a city that doesn't extend to the whole state. Um, and we see, uh, again, the city-state of Estonia uh, doing some e-government stuff pretty well. And we see the Nordic countries, uh, many of them like the capital city of Finland, Helsinki, uh, has their own policy lab that does really well. And I think the, one of the commonality is that because it's city-sized, people still share uh, each other's life experience comparatively closely. Whereas in, for example, uh, the United States, people who live in one coast and the other coast, they don't share that much common life experiences, making it much harder to have an informed deliberation or a discussion when the life experience uh, differs so much, which is why we see open government mostly advanced in a city level, uh, what we call the sub, uh, sub-national level. And Taiwan is somewhere between the subnational level and the national level because of our size being small, but our population being large. And so, yeah, I think we have a lot to learn uh, technique-wise uh, with many other cities, but we have a lot to teach um, population-wise uh, to many other larger countries. This is our current uh, open government diplomatic situation. Is green policy suitable as a discussion topic for the public policy platform? For sure, for sure. Um, the energy white paper um, process, which I will again refer to, uh, is an excellent example because it doesn't just talk about renewable energy. It, it talks about uh, why we're doing this um, renewable energy thing and how exactly does the re renewable energy options compare to each other. And so, um, this round, um, this is quite different from the previous rounds because um, the general public can have an input not just after the experts consolidate their ideas, but everybody can raise their concerns and their discussions um, when it comes to the energy issues and also the international issues that will be related uh, to the energy policy. So. Um, in the previous rounds of or other national-wide discussion of energy, there's been quite a few. Um, the government settles on a few topics for the citizen to talk about. But this time around, the preparatory meetings, as well as the collaborative meetings, they can add any topics in addition to the 19 uh, that was identified by the Ministry of Economic Affairs as well as the uh, Energy uh, Office of Taiwan. So this time around, it's a much more equal um, relationship between the people who work on policy in civil society and people who work on policy in the national government. How should the government take the lead in innovation? Um, very briefly, it shouldn't. Uh, the, the innovation, um, I think, is the purview of the private sector and the civil society. And indeed, this is how we designed the plan of DigiPlus 2025. Um, the previous version of DigiPlus, the NACI plan, 
mostly focus on the infrastructure, the broadband, um, the data policy, and things like that. But in addition to the NACI plan, we're now saying, okay, we have to work on our own governance system to make sure that we are responsive and reactive uh, to the problems uh, that are surfaced by the people. But as for the problem solving capability, we actually use a lot of sandbox laws, a lot of um, you know um, procurement laws, a lot of uh, laws that are adjusted toward enabling the innovators to be as quick as possible to come up with possible solutions to have a test site uh, for them to try out their ideas and to integrate to the society. Essentially, have the innovators lead the government's regulations instead of having the government blocking the innovators from innovating. And again, from delivering those innovations to solve actual local problems, we work with the civil society, the NGOs, the social enterprises, because for many multinational issues like um, climate change or whatever, the government is, is too small. But for many small issues, for many local issues, the government is too large because the government can only change direction once every year. So because of that, we prefer now to work with social enterprises and NGOs who solve the same problem the government is solving, but much more efficiently working on a local issue. And so this is why every other Tuesday, I just tour around Taiwan and uh, talk with the local social innovators and have the 11 ministries try to uh, answer their questions um, effectively. And this is because we believe in solving the problem for the local problem solvers instead of just use our KPIs to solve exactly the problem identified last year. Right. So for any emergent issues, we prefer to work uh, with the private sector. And this is also why instead of uh, the old NISI plan where you require a minister with a portfolio or require the deputy uh, prime minister or the prime minister uh, to convene any meetings. In this time, the innovation, the talents, and the uh, um, infrastructure plan are all just convened by individual minister and chief commissioners. So they will work directly across ministry boundaries in order to make their um, working group work. And so again, this is a less hierarchical way of working on things and much more agile way to work on the innovation, the development, and the inclusion part. And so my main work is just on um, uh, modernizing our own workforce, uh, working with the NDC people, um, and this is me, uh, on the digitization of the government workflow, the open data, the regulation and cybersecurity, the enabling part of the government plan, but we don't try to out-innovate the private sector and civil society innovators. We think they innovate much better than we do. And our work is to just solve their problems and not get in their way. How can we make some effective policies to prevent air pollution from China? This is a great question. Um, well, this is, this is actually not infeasible if we somehow work out a agreement somehow, right? Or if we come up with a technology that could somehow capture those pollutions or somehow to make its effect less, um, uh, less uh, harsh uh, to the local environment. Some of this require technology, some of them require diplomacy, uh, some of them just require a lot of evidence-based planning. And, but all of this uh, rests on the actual fact that it is actually coming from China and not other directions. We, we actually don't know. For any given day, we don't actually know the actual percent of PM2.5 coming from the mobile, the immobile, and uh, overseas directions. We have some very vague um, coarse-grained values, but we don't actually know. So, of course, we can work on policies before we know the actual distribution and actual um, air pollution model, but I would prefer uh, for Kongong Mission Wuyuan next year to work out the actual model before we identify the actual, the most serious problems and sort them one by one. So that's the, the answer that I have at this point. Air pollution is one of the reasons for global warming. If we do not know what has caused air pollution in Taiwan, how should we reduce um, global warming policy? Well, yeah, but just because we don't know exactly where the air pollution are coming from going forward, doesn't mean that we can't work on, um, you know, 
uh, reducing carbon emission or to use more re renewable energy or to be you know carbon neutral in many of our purchases or to um, you know produce things that's more uh, sustainable more environmental value of circular economy and so on there's many causes of the climate change and we can work on the ones that we have a very solid understanding already while uh, figuring out the ones that we don't have much ideas about so I don't think this is a um, a exclusion of working on the other uh, parts of climate change. What is the most important element of open government? This is actually a very difficult question. Um, if we see open government as a way for people to regain trust in democracy, then we will say, of course, um, transparency is the most important thing. We need to be transparent so that the civil society can trust us. But many people in the civil society will say it's not like that. Participation. The more people who can participate, the more people who have an interest in public policy is more, more, more important. Even though the government is not being transparent, just the fact of people starting to care and to implement policies by themselves will be um, the most important thing in open government. And, of course, many public servants would, would say that an efficient way to be accountable, to make sure that nobody does the same work twice, uh, nobody gets uh, inappropriately assigned a task that doesn't belong to them, to not answer to the same questions in five different formats all over the time, um, that is the most important thing, to build a properly automated accountable framework. That's the most important thing. And, of course, there's many people who would say inclusion. The diversity of participants is the most important value. The reason why we list the four values is that for all the different sectors, each sector would value them differently. And so we list four of them um, all together because without the other three values, any one of the pillars cannot stand on its own. Um, to have transparency without participation or accountability would just basically be marketing, right? But to have participation without the base facts of transparency or accountability is much of a show as anything else. To have a accountability that is just internal to a public system is just a more efficient public service system, but it's not democratic, and so on. And if everything works but it's not inclusive or not diversified, then it all just means open government, but for the elites, for people who are specializing in law or in programming, right? So I think all this four pillars are equally important. But I think the diversity, the inclusion, the fourth pillar, I think in Taiwan is much more important than the other pillars at this moment, just because we have a lot of different camps who don't want to listen to each other when it comes to ideological issues. But that's my personal take. You may disagree. Um, many people would say that the four pillars are all needed and there's no one pillar that's more important the other, than the others. Uh, this I already answered, about 25 using the collaborative workshops and another 15 or so outside of the PO network. <clears throat> Do you think the price of water and power should be enhanced? This is basically saying, are we willing to pay more uh, for renewable energy? Um, this is a, a very good question. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, if the energy white paper is out and everybody has a consensus that we, we are willing to pay a little bit more for renewable energy, this is a good idea if everybody can see this, um, how it's calculated and it doesn't adversely affect people who are uh, more in need uh, than other people. But because of the white, uh, energy white paper has not yet finalized, we don't actually know how much, and as, which is why I encourage your participation on the energy white paper uh, forming process. Do you think voting is a good way? Is every vote equal? Can it really reflect truth? I think when you vote for people, um, many, many voters will feel disappointed. In all the national elections, every four years, every two years, every vote is, has more than half chance of being wasted meaning that you don't have to cast a vote, you vote knowing that the person you vote wouldn't, wouldn't make it, or some other gerrymandering ways. But if we vote for petitions, we vote for policy, 
we vote for priority, we vote for participatory budget, we vote for you know referendum or whatever. You can you can petition five things, and only two of them ends up being national policy. You still feel that you contributed, that you've won, right? There there's no losers when it comes to voting for policies priorities, but people will feel like losing when they're voting for people and it's, you know, one winner takes all vote. So I think voting by itself is neutral. It's what we vote is important. And we're trying to design much more opportunity for participation when people vote for budget or for policy instead of just for people. Is it possible for the participation offices could work at home in the future? Oh yeah, um, for sure. Um, there, there is actually um, a Ren Shizong Shuhan that says, if your work has anything to do with internet communication, you don't have to work in normal hours. You can work in any hour you like, as long as your boss is okay with it. And then uh, there's another clause that says, oh, by the way, if your boss thinks you're more efficient uh, working on internet communication in some other place than the office, you're free to work there too. And so this is one of the working conditions when I negotiated with the Prime Minister. I invoked this clause saying, all my work is related to internet communication, and so I, I get to work anywhere. And, and, I, and then recursively, everyone in my office, the 20 people or so, all get to work anywhere. <clears throat> and so if you can convince your, your manager, then at the moment already you can work at any place, even at home. On the concept development map, who is the solution provider? All the stakeholders can be solution providers. Anyone who commit to an action, for example, when Facebook commit to join the local e-commerce association, when the local um, fishes, pe fishes people agree to uh, help the coastal guard to uh, patrol, when any stakeholder commit to something, they become the solution provider. And so one of the ways why we call this multi-stakeholder meeting is that the government is not the monopoly of uh, solution providing. The government is provides the platform, but most of the time it requires at least some coordination with the civil society and with the private sector in order to uh, solve the problem in a coordinated fashion. How to promote innovative work under the bureaucracy? Personally, I think um, the, the, the higher uh, ranked officials need to absorb the risk and then afterwards share the credit if something actually works well. And this is something that I've always worked like this. Any, anyone in the participation office and network, anyone at PETIS is free to innovate on any direction they like. And because it's experimental, if it goes wrong, it's always Audrey's fault. And because of that, uh, we see a lot of people actually very willing to innovate. And when they make something right, you go back and check the transcript and actually see them and they get the credit. Um, how the government avoid, avoids organizing dwarfism? Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, I, I don't actually know what dwarfism means in this context. I, I thought um, my, in my mental image, it is like the organization that sees itself as being very low, very small and helpless. It's like learned helplessness to tackle real large scale problems. When, when viewed this way, I think the most um, if efficient solution is to see ourselves not as regulators, but as people who provide service and who learn together with the citizens, with the civil society and the private sector, so that they are large and it is okay because we stand on the shoulder of the giants and try to work and whisper with the giants and try to not get into the giants' way and also steer them occasionally in the right direction. So I'm, of course, an anarchist, but in uh, practice, in my lifetime, what I can hope is that only that the government will see itself as a more of a facilitating role rather than a dictating role, and so it will not be affected by dwarfism. And so, yeah, thank you very much for listening to this uh, speech and asking so many good questions. Thank you so much. Thank you,老师,今天在这门精彩的演讲。那我们今天的活动到此告一段落。提醒您,您开始别忘了学生的行李。嗯,谢谢。那我们下一次的尽量准时在六点五十前就先到教室。谢谢。
啊，有提问的人记得要写单子哦，才这样这样才会有记录。有没有在录？如果他现在中途录，我们就完蛋，就不知道他什么时候在。